Hello, everyone. Today we have Radoslav Ivanov from RPI. As you can see, he's an assistant professor there in the Department of Computer Science. Prior to this, he was a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania. He also got his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, his research interests are in the area of safe and secure autonomy with a focus on verified machine learning, control theory, and cyber physical security. And the natural application domains of his work are automotive and medical CPS. Uh, he does some very interesting work on the verification of machine learning based controllers. So that's what I guess he's going to talk about today. And uh, yeah, without further ado, rather go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for a nice introduction, Yash. Uh, so yeah, so we overlap with Yash for a long time with Ben. Uh, but uh, yeah, now we're also oh, close by, not so far. Um, so yeah, so hello everyone. Yeah, so uh, my name is Rado. You can call me Rado, uh, Radoslav, whatever you prefer. I started RPI in January, so it's a very fresh move for me still. Um, and so yeah, so today I'm going to talk to you about my recent work over the last, uh, at this point, three, four years uh, on safe and secure autonomy. Um, and so again, this will be from the ver from the perspective of verification and um, and control. So we'll be verifying machine learning methods also in combination with control. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, so if I can move the slide. Okay. okay, so in the last few years, we've seen a lot of progress in autonomy, right? So uh, all across, the, across the field, right? So for example, in control, it made a lot of impressive progress. So this is the video of the Boston Dynamics Atlas robot performing some pretty cool acrobatics. Um, so of course, it's with perfect information, but still the control is quite impressive. Um, another very impressive uh, control, uh, I guess, video is from the DARPA Robotics Challenge from a few years ago, um, where once again, they had to, uh, the, the control and planning tasks were uh, quite uh, difficult because they had to, as you can see, they have different manipulators, they, uh, they switch how they walk and so on. So this was a very impressive um, uh, task as well. Um, we've also made a lot of progress in perception, right? So this is the uh, YOLO neural network from Facebook. And you can see that it's pretty good at recognizing most objects in the image, right? So it's quite good um, at recognition. Um, and on top of just pure object recognition, we've also made a lot of progress in overall in computer vision. Um, so this is another uh, interesting example uh, from Penn where people were able to infer 3D properties of objects from 2D images. Uh, which was also quite uh, interesting and impressive. And on top of that, now, of course, we've made a lot of progress in learning and especially in reinforcement learning. And so this is a cool video from uh, a few years back now, but uh, this robot is trying to learn to flip pancakes, right? And so it's uh, reinforcement learning on the real thing. So it's quite, quite difficult to do. Uh, so you can see after many, many trials, eventually uh, they get the reward right and then the robot is able to learn. Um, and another impressive, more recent work in reinforcement learning has been in the field of games, right? Like Go, and this one is StarCraft here, where um, the computer was able to learn very, very good strategies better than, than the best human players in these uh, very high dimensional uh, uh, games. Um, so this is another very important, um, and I guess a milestone for reinforcement learning. Um, but of course, despite all this progress, we're not quite there yet, right? So we have, for example, in autonomous driving, we've seen crashes across the board, right? So Tesla, Uber, Waymo, I don't want to point any fingers. Basically, everyone has had crashes, right? Um, due to different, uh, of course, factors. But even also, I would argue the, the, the Boeing 737 MAX crashes, but also to some degree caused by imperfect autonomy, right? Because... There was some interaction between the human and the, the newly introduced system, autonomous system that was imperfect. Um, and on top of these purely kind of algorithmical um, issues, there's also a lot of security issues. Um, so you might remember these were from a few years back now, but uh, for example, there was a drone that was captured in Iran a few years ago um, using GPS uh, jamming. Um, there was also a, a famous car hack that happened uh, around 10 years ago now where the, the, the hackers were able to get on the car's internal network. And then from there, they could control all the different uh, electronic units on the car. Um, and there was also another very sneaky one with, uh, where they were able to drive a boat, of course, using GPS uh, uh, spoofing. So they were able to very slightly perturb the GPS signal 
uh, and still fool the actual human sailors on board. So this was not even an autonomous system, but you could see that even, even human controllers uh, were able to be fooled. Um, so on top of all of these vulnerabilities, there's also now the issue of neural networks, right? Because we're increasingly using neural networks in these systems. I mean, they're kind of what really enabled the, the, the latest push in autonomy. So people are using them for perception, for control in various systems. So this on the left, I think, is an example of Uber's system. Um, and on the right is an example of a system where the network was used for um, air traffic control, uh, or collision avoidance, I should say. Um, but in both of these domains, people have found issues, right? So this is the famous uh, Panda image from a few years ago now where uh, you could start with a perfectly classified, perfectly classified image of a panda. You add some very small noise, very carefully chosen, but very small. And then you end up with an image that looks exactly the same to the human, but now the network thinks it's a given with 99% confidence, right? And this is not just for pandas. This is virtually true for every image and every neural network out there. And we can find these adversarial examples. And people also found such examples in the control domain as well. Um, so they were able to find an example where the network would output an unsafe control action for perfectly normal uh, inputs that are that could happen in practice. Right. So now th there's all of these different types of vulnerabilities that we need to consider. So I think before we uh, move on, I think it makes sense to kind of stop and think about what is common among among these systems. Right. And I think the the commonality is that they're all cyber physical systems. Right. So these are systems uh, that have a tight coupling between communication, computation, and control, right? Interaction with the physical world. Um, and so these are systems across the, the domain. Again, aircraft, uh, autonomous cars, robots, medical cyber physical systems, um, and so on. So these systems have, I think, what uh, uh, they have in common what we kind of care about, which are these types of vulnerabilities that we are um, interested in addressing. Um, and so now that we have this kind of, uh, um, I guess the, the the common class of systems. We can also look at the types of problems that we're uh, we can we need to address, right, to move forward. Um, so on the one hand, we need to address the problems of um, information gathering, information processing, also. And so here, there are lots of problems that we haven't really uh, uh, that we are kind of in the process of addressing, like in perception, prediction of of what agents will do, but also maybe we need to actively acquire information and so on. Um, then we also, once we have a good information, now we need to do the control, right? We need to interact with the environment. And there here, there are many different challenges where, first of all, we need to interact with humans, right? Which is a completely different ball game for, <laughs> for most of us engineers. Uh, uh, on top of that, we need to build privacy and trust in these systems. And then of course, we need to, to still solve the very technical distributed control and computation problems. Um, then on, on top of that, we need to worry about safety, right? So often, at least for now, safety is kind of an afterthought, right? We try to build the system and then we analyze it, um, which may be not the best way to go, but uh, here at least there are problems to, to solve in terms of verification, also detection and recovery. Can we detect when something is wrong? Uh, can we recover? And then can we build these assurance cases, uh, uh, which are basically a composition of different evidences and arguments that we have. And finally, another aspect that compromises safety is security, right? So here we need to worry about secure communication, secure computation. How does how do those affect our safety and overall the performance of our system? And once again, here there are problems of detecting when we're under attack and hopefully recovering, right? So we need a lot of expertise from different domains to solve all these problems. So my expertise is mostly kind of at the intersection of formal methods, machine learning, and control. And so specifically, here are some of my contributions, uh, which I'll talk about um, today. Some of them, obviously. Okay. So it, overall, I'm just going, I want to talk to you about what I would like to develop, which is the science of safe uh, CPS. Okay. So again, feel free to interrupt me uh, when you have any. If you have any questions, I'll try to uh, uh, get to the technical bits soon here. Okay. So, uh, so first, I'd like to 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 think about safety or to kind of set the stage for how do we even want to think about safety. So to do that, let's look at a standard CPS that we had in our lab at Penn and that Yash was also instrumental in developing. And this is the um, F110 card. 
Right, so this is a, a racing car that is trying to navigate this environment as fast as possible. So now this was at the first competition in Pittsburgh uh, where we won actually. Um, and so this is a very standard CPS, right? It has a physical plant that operates in some sort of an environment. It has access to some sensors. So in this case, it has a LiDAR sensor, this yellow thing at the front that it provides a laser scan. And then it has some computational unit that provides uh, the perception of the control. And then this unit, of course, closes the loop. Um, and we have a fully closed loop system where on the left, we have the physical part of the system. On the right, we have the cyber part and hence the name uh, CPS, right? Uh, and so uh, now for this system, about safety is not so clear. Um, oh, here's the little jump. Um, so we, I think it makes sense to have a two-pronged approach to, to think about safety. So I think it makes sense to have, first of all, an offline approach where we kind of model the system and then we uh, uh, try to uh, but analyze these models, analyze the safety of the model, first of all itself, maybe verify the model if we have more complex structures like neural networks, and then build assurance cases for this model. So this will be done offline before the system is running. And then while it's running, we also need to now build online techniques for monitoring unsafe events, monitoring and unmodeled events. How do we detect when something is wrong, if there is an attack, and perhaps have some sort of a simplex architecture where we can if we detect an attack, let's say, then we can switch to a more conservative but safer uh, mode. So I've done work in both of these domains. And so today I'm gonna to talk about one these one item from each of these categories. Um, so in the offline uh, uh, category, I'm gonna talk about my work on verification of, of, of these autonomous systems that have neural network controllers. Uh, and so this, uh, this work has been ongoing now for a few years. There's even more publications that are listed uh, but uh, uh, today I'll be talking mostly about this type of work. And then in the online domain, I've also done a lot of work on detection, uh, mostly in the case of medical CPS, because there's it's really paramount there that we're able to detect unsafe events um, and, and be able to alert clinicians. Um, but I've also done also a lot of work on sensor attack detection and more generally sensor fusion. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about these two items in the red and mostly focusing on the one uh, at the top. So let's let's get started on verification of autonomous systems with neural network controllers. Um, so first, let's just get out of the way the, the easy bit. So what are neural networks? Uh, at this point, I'm guessing everyone knows what they are. It's quite a, it's been quite a while since they overtook our fields. Um, so, but anyway, just very quickly. So neural networks are effectively functions, right? So they take a number of inputs, um, and then they produce some outputs at the end. And in between are what are all these hidden layers, right? So every hidden layer is composed of a number of neurons. And so every neuron, like this one N here, computes some very simple function, right? So what N does is it computes a, first of all, a weighted sum of its inputs, right? So it computes this very easy uh, weighted sum followed by a very small nonlinear activation. Right, so, so these activations could be something like the ReLU, which is effectively uh, the also known as a hockey stick, just a, a piecewise linear function, and uh, the sigmoid, which is a smooth function going from zero to one. Right, so there are many others at this point, probably dozens and hundreds maybe even, uh, but these are the main ones. Um, and so, of course, every neuron computes a very slightly nonlinear thing, but if you if you compose everything and if you have enough neurons and enough uh, 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 layers, you can approximate virtually any continuous function. So that's why they're super powerful. Now, of course, you might be asking the question, okay, but if we know that they're so complex and hard to analyze and they have these vulnerabilities, why do you want to even use them in, in these uh, uh, safety critical systems, especially for control? Um, and, and there are a few answers. Uh, it's a valid question, I think, but there are a few answers uh, at this point, right? So one is reinforcement learning, right? So in reinforcement learning, oftentimes we do it because we don't know how to build a controller, right? If we have a complex environment that requires a very complex controller, sometimes we just have no choice. Um, that, and so some of those games that, that recently have been uh, solved are examples in point. Um, Another interesting example that I, I've seen is where people can use neural networks to approximate uh, some other type of controller, such as a model predictive controller, which may be very hard to compute online, 
So what people can do is they can take the network first, train it offline, collect some data, train it to approximate the MPC, and then online you use the network, which hopefully it's a good approximation. Uh, so you can you can put this on an embedded platform, if you will, and you can use the MPC. Um, and let me also give you an example from our work with the um, F110 car um, to see that it sometimes it makes sense even there to use uh, neural networks. So if we go back to our closed loop system, again, we have the plant, we have the environment uh, and the LiDAR sensors. So now first, the controller that we built for the competition was already kind of complex, right? Because we had a, first of all, a state estimator to tell us where we are in between the walls. We had a detector to kind of detect when it's time to turn, when we are reaching a corner. And then we had this hierarchical controller, basically a PID uh, stack of controllers where depending on which mode we are in, we use a different controller. And so this controller worked fine for that very specific environment. We had to tune all the controllers and everything, um, all the PADs, but um, it, 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 it's not so trivial. And the reason for that is this, right? So this is LiDAR data. This is a LiDAR scan from a um, right-hand turn. So here the little blue triangle is the car. And then the little pink purple dots are, each one is a one single LiDAR uh, uh, ray. So when you, when you have the entire scan, you see kind of the right hand turn. The issue is that you have, first of all, the issue, one of the issues is that you have these gaps, right, in the wall, which are not really gaps. <laughs> uh, they're actually uh, reflective surfaces, right? So there, for example, on the left hand side, there is a door, um, and then that door has a metallic piece that reflects everything. And so it looks like there's a gap, but actually there is no gap, so you can't go there. Um, and so this is one of the issues, right? There are all these data artifacts that are these specific ones are peculiar to LiDAR, but every, every high dimensional sensor has some peculiarities. Um, and on top of that, you have to, if you were to build something manually like we did, you have to consider every wall, have to consider, okay, is this, is this the model for that, uh, for that uh, specific dimension or is it the other wall or is it the fourth wall, right? So this becomes quite computational also, and also quite uh, difficult to, to, to come up with a closed form solution. So it makes sense to use a neural network, right? So you can have to, to use this high dimensional uh, scan and kind of learn a controller. Um, but of course, then the question is, if, if you're going to do it, is it actually gonna be safe? Uh, and then uh, one way to, to, to reason about this is, is through verification. So can we actually verify that this system will be safe? Okay, so now we have kind of motivated why we wanna use neural networks. Uh, so here is the full now verification problem, right? So we're going back to our uh, closed loop system. So here, first of all, we have the plant. So this is an offline approach, keep in mind. So we're gonna model this, the plant. So I would argue for this car, the model is not gonna be too bad. And we have actually verified that it's you know, checked. I should say not verified, but the model is fairly okay for the dynamics. So you can model, uh, you can, we have states like position, velocity, orientation. And then uh, we can model the dynamics of the, of the car using all these, right? So um, standard order differential equations. Um, then we also need to model the measurements, right? Um, so in some cases, it's easier to model measurements than others, right? So LiDAR is on the border of being able to be modeled, but I would argue for a hallway environment, let's say it's doable. And for simpler systems, it's obviously uh, much easier if you have measurements like GPS and so on. Right, so here we need a function G that models the measurements as a function of the state. Um, and finally, of course, we have the neural network which will map our measurements to controls. Um, so this is at a high level not the problem, I'm gonna state, uh, and then I'm gonna make it formal as we go. Uh, but for now, keep in mind this goal, which is that we now given these models of the, of the system, we'd like to be able to verify that our car, let's say, will not crash into walls. Right, so this is the first kind of a very high level goal. Um, so keep that in mind as we go. Um, so before we move on, I wanted to mention that there is a lot of work already on verification of neural networks and robustness analysis and so on. Um, so for example, in verification, there are lots of tools like Reloplex and Sherlock um, and so on, which kind of analyze input output properties of the neural network, like, like the Panda example um, and so on. So they try to find examples, adversary examples, or, or show that they don't exist. Uh, similarly, there is work on robustness analysis, estimating Lipschitz constant bounds, and so on. Uh, there's a lot of work on adversarial training, robust training, and so on, right? So there, this is a huge field at this point. This is already stuff from five years ago, right? So now 
it has, it has exploded exponentially. Um, but what I want to say is that most of these works uh, are focusing on the neural network in isolation, right? So they don't consider the entire closed loop system. So then we need something else because we need to somehow compose these arguments. Uh, so it's not, that's not trivial um, because we need to consider this interaction between the neural network and the plant over time and verify that the plant is safe over time, right? So here we don't care so much about exactly what the neural network will do as long as it is safe, as long as the plant is overall safe. Um, so this is kind of different. So we don't know, we don't have any specific specs for the neural network, but only for the system itself. Okay, so now, uh, now that we're verifying closed loop systems, now actually it turns out that, that dynamical system verification is a reachability problem of sorts, which is, here's what I mean by that. So typically in a reachability problem, uh, we consider an initial set of our states, so let's say a set of positions for the car in the hallway, and we consider some of the unsafe uh, uh, states, right? So let's say in the car case, it would be the walls, but we'll get there. Uh, and so then what we want to do is we want to say, okay, so here's perhaps all of the possible st uh, states that the, the system will reach during its execution, right? So this is called the reachable set over time. So the, the, the set of states that are reachable. So for example, maybe that's one trajectory where you start from that initial point on the left and you, and you try to avoid the unsafe state, right? So in the context of the car, uh, for example, let's say the initial set would be the in the middle of the hallway at the start at the bottom, and the unsafe set would be the walls, right? And so you're trying to navigate uh, this hallway. Uh, and so now we want to analyze this closed loop system and verify that it's safe. Um, and I should say that there also exists a lot of tools for reachability analysis for standard controllers, right? There's tools like Flowstar, DRH, and so on. Um, but these tools, of course, do not directly work for neural networks because those are quite high dimensional and complex. Uh, and, and they were built mostly for, um, for differential equations, um, not so much for high dimensional linear maps. Um, and so these works, what they do is they compute these, uh, what is known as flow pipes, right? So they basically, what it means is that they, uh, they compute one little step of time uh, or, the, or all the states that will reach over that little uh, time region. And then they repeat that, assuming that that little step is the next initial condition for the next step. So they look something like this, these flow pipes. So they basically, uh, over every little uh, time step, they compute, they over approximate even the region of, uh, of reachable states, and then they repeat until they reach the end, right? And so if you take the union of those flow pipes, that will be an over approximation of the entire uh, reachable set. That's kind of the goal. Um, so because computing the exact Reachable set is undecidable. So you typically we over approximate and then hope that the over approximation itself is safe, which uh, means that the actual set is safe. So this is kind of the, uh, the state of the art. And then of course the challenge is now, what do we do about neural networks? And this is where we come in. Okay, so now let me state the exact problem statement and then I can give you the, uh, our approach. Okay, so again, the plant dynamics are given as differential equations uh, or a hybrid system. And the measurements are given to us. We have a neural network controller with smooth activations. And so we'll see in a second why the, this is what we assume. And then uh, the specific problem that we consider is a reachability problem, right? It says, um, assuming that uh, the states, the initial uh, states X of zero start in some initial set X zero, can we verify some property psi of X of T uh, for all time T, right? So can we verify some safety property? So this is exactly the, the formal reachability statement. Um, and then um, this is what we're trying to solve. Basically, we're trying to compute that reachable set. Okay, so this is now a precise problem. And so now let me give you the very high level of our solution. Um, again, I should say that also there are other approaches here uh, for networks with ReLU activations. Um, so they're slightly different. It turns out that the activation function affects quite a bit the approaches. So there's quite a few different uh, kind of orthogonal works at this point. Um, there's also very interesting work on abstracting the neural network as a, some sort of a simple uh, program in a domain specific language and then performing verification on that. And that's also possible, uh, but today we're gonna focus on the actual neural network. Okay, so, so here's, here's the main idea of very simple. Um, so we're considering networks with sigmoids, 
And the main idea is that actually the, the sigmoid can be expressed, the sigmoid derivative can be expressed as a function of the sigmoid itself. So here's a sigmoid on the left. The sigmoid is a very simple function, right? Just one over one plus e to the minus x. And this, the, the derivative of the sigmoid can actually be written as this on the right. So it can be, it is sigma times one minus sigma. So I'm not gonna derive it, but that's, uh, it's a two line derivation. So this is not interesting because this almost looks like a dynamical system, right? So we almost have sigma dot is equal to sigma times one minus x, except we don't have time. So what we'll do is we'll add time. So we come up with this proxy function G that we called it, that is also taking time as input T. So you see that T is multiplied by X in the denominator. So if I plug in one for T, I exactly recovered sigma, right? G of one and X is equal to sigma of X. But now crucially, I can compute the partial derivative with respect to T. So now I have a G dot and I can use the chain rule so g dot is now basically x times g times one minus g, right? So now it's a, exactly now it's a dynamical system where the initial condition, if I plug in zero for t, um, I just get half because in the bottom I get one plus one uh, and in the numerator is one. So now g is trying to capture the sigmoid. So let's see uh, an example first. So let's suppose that we have an x of four and let's look at our sigma sigmoid curve. So sigma four, is there on the right, right? So now G, what we'll do is G starts at 0.5, right? As prescribed at time zero. And so now as time goes, G will track the sigmoid curve because that's how we designed it, right? So when we go from zero to time uh, 0.25, now uh, that's the same as sigma of one because uh, 0.25 times four is one. Um, and then we move on at time half, uh, we uncover the value of sigma of two, and then time 0.75, we get to sigma of three, and then eventually we get to sigma four. Uh, so g at time one is exactly the value of, of, of sigma four. Now, of course, this is uh, nice and good, but why is it useful? And the reason it's useful for us is because when x is not a point, but a set, now we can compute reachable sets uh, because we have a dynamical system and we know how to compute how to perform reachability for dynamical systems. So this is the whole reason we did this uh, mapping is that we, we know how to do reachability for standard dynamical systems. We just don't know how to do it for neural networks, but now we have mapped that problem to reachability. So overall here is the approach, right? So we take the neural network and we are gonna transform it into a dynamical system. And it's actually gonna be hybrid because we have multiple layers. So at every layer, first we do the linear, uh, map of the neural network, which is effectively a, uh, a, a jump in the hybrid system. And then we perform this sigmoid integration, which is the continuous part in the mode. And then we do this for every uh, neuron. So we have a big hybrid system for neural network. And then of course we have our plant, which is also a hybrid system or any dynamical system. We can compose them and we get a bigger hybrid system for the full closed loop system that we can now um, analyze using existing tools and, and we can adapt those tools as well. So this is kind of the full uh, pipeline. So let me give you a quick example here and maybe uh, I can stop answering any questions if there are any. Um, okay, so here is one neural network, right? This one has three inputs, two outputs. So let's look at what happens to this neuron, right? So this neuron has again, three inputs. So what will happen is in, we'll, we'll build now the hybrid system that corresponds to this neural network. So first we're gonna build, so it turns out that we need two states in the hybrid system for this neuron G. So first we need one state X that will store this linear map, right? The, the weighted sum. So X will be that state. And then we need the actual G which will perform this sigmoid integration. Uh, so this is our proxy function from before, right? So G is gonna, uh, inside the actual mode with, with continuous dynamics, G will evolve according to that sigmoid um, dynamics. So this is the exact same chain rule from before. So now G will basically compute the sigmoid of X1. And then of course we have more of these Gs for every, uh, for every neuron in that layer. So this whole mode in this hybrid system corresponds to that first layer of the neural network. And then we, we do the same, right? So when we get to time equals one, we have already computed all of those sigmoid values. 
and then we trans, uh, transition to the next uh, layer and the next mode. So once again, now this, the X values are gonna be the linear maps of the Gs from the previous layer. The Gs go back to half and then we repeat. And then the Gs are gonna again compute the sigmoids of the Xs. Um, and then at the, at the end, we're gonna output uh, the, um, well, the Us in the neural network, which will be also the, uh, the Gs in the hybrid system. So at the end of the day, if we have a neural network that has K layers and then neurons per layer, we end up with the hybrid system that has K modes. So the same number of modes as layers, but we have two N states because we need the X and the G for every neuron. So two states per neuron, uh, per layer. And then we can reuse those names, of course. So this is the full uh, transition that we did. So um, I can maybe stop here for a question or two if there are any technical. I have a quick question. So when you do the transition, when t is equal to one, is t being reset back to zero when you move on to the next layer? T is, yes, yes, t is reset. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. <laughs> okay, so for each of these, t goes from zero to one. And when you, okay, when you're at one, you have done the, I guess yeah, you have yeah, yeah. gone through the whole sigma, okay. Yeah, and there's also sigma. an invariant, yes. I mean, this is not the full definition of the hybrid system. Yes, yes, you're right. Okay, cool, thank you. Any other question? Um, are we to assume that there's also, uh, in this definition of X1, we also need the bias there? Ah, yeah, you could have a bias if you want, yeah. Okay. I have just forgot to add them in. Yeah, exactly. Okay, if not, let's, let me continue. Uh, let's look at some of the uh, case studies that we did and then we can come back to this uh, at the end. Um, so, okay, so one extension that I should quickly mention that I don't have time to talk about is uh, we're actually able to uh, approximate uh, every uh, sigmoid with a Taylor model direct. So at the end of the day, what we get after this integration is a Taylor model, which is effectively a polynomial uh, with error bounds. So we can actually, because we know the functional form of the sigmoid, we can directly come up with such a Taylor model, which actually gives us an order of magnitude improvement in scalability. So this was a, a, good, um, uh, a good extension that we did. Anyway, so we have a couple of case studies. Uh, uh, sorry, Rado, quick, another quick question before you move on. So when you do the Taylor approximation there, uh, how much yeah. do you lose in terms of accuracy and you know, where do you draw the line? Good in point. So actually, uh, in, I, from our experiments, in order for us to lose in accuracy, we have to have very small steps in the integration process. So typically, actually, we gain accuracy also because we, um, well, we can come up with an arbitrarily long Taylor series uh, for the sigmoid. Yeah. So actually, it turns out that it's actually better in both ways. <laughs> cool. Great. Yeah. Surprisingly, but yes. Um, okay. So, uh, so we have a bunch of case studies at this point. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, two of them today, but so uh, I just want to say that in terms of scalability, we're about, we can handle networks with about a thousand neurons. Again, it depends on the specifics of the, of the hybrid system and everything, but this is kind of a rule of thumb, right? So maybe about a hundred neurons per layer and so on. Um, and so here are also the links um, to the tool. Um, so today I'm going to talk about, I guess, mostly about the um, F110 uh, case study. Okay, so what we did in the, for the car, of course, is first we model the car. Uh, so we use the bicycle model, which is a standard model for vehicles with front steering, right? So we have four states, two states for position, one state for velocity, and one for orientation. Um, we have two controls, but one is uh, we're going to keep constant just for the sake of this problem, which is thrust. And the other one is the steering of the front wheels. Uh, which is what the, the neural network will control. We also have to model the measurements, right? So we are gonna model actually based on the car state and the dimensions of the hallway, we can model every li LIDAR equation, right? So every array. So because we have four walls, we have four equations, depending on which wall you hit, it's a different uh, trigonometry exercise. And uh, we're gonna use 41 rays for verification purposes because uh, the full LiDAR is more than a thousand, but then this hybrid, uh, uh, the, the four equations introduce a hybrid model, which makes it very hard to, to do over time because if there are, uh, if there is some uncertainty, if, if we can see different walls, 
we have to consider every case, uh, it's, it's, I mean, every case uh, um, on its own. And then over time, the number of cases can explode. Um, so this is, this is why we cannot handle the full 1,000 dimensional line. Okay, now for the controller, uh, we train the neural network using reinforcement learning. So using the model from the previous slide, we built a simple simulator. Um, and then we trained the neural network with uh, 10 H activation functions. Um, so it has two layers with 64 neurons per layer. Um, and then uh, it outputs, of course, the uh, steering. Um, so, okay, so, uh, so then we were able to actually verify that this system is safe. So we're able to, after training, um, we fit this into our uh, tool called Verisync. And then, uh, so what we have to do is we have this initial uh, interval um, where we start the car. So we actually have to subdivide this into, uh, into 40 subsets because of um, when, uh, again, when we're doing reachability, uh, the, we have to over approximate the reachable set. And sometimes this over approximation can explode. So when that happens, we have to reduce the size of the initial uh, set. And so that's why we have to do it uh, subdivide into 40. Each one took about, um, I forget at this point, maybe half an hour or so. So this was a big, uh, big case study. We had to do it on the server. Uh, but at the end of the day, we were able to verify that, uh, that the system is safe. Um, and it's actually, um, yeah, it's actually able to navigate this entire hallway. Um, and again, the difficulty was introduced mostly by the LiDAR Actually, this was the, the main part of the computational spend doing all the LIDAR because we have so many different rays to consider. Um, okay, so now okay, cool. this um, is the question. Yeah, sorry, no, no, another quick question. So mm -hmm. your policy takes in LIDAR scan, so this 41 dimensional input, uh, is that right? And the output for the policy is going to be steering angle? Yeah, so it just takes the 41 rays, uh, I think normalized, and then outputs, yeah, outputs one, a one. number between zero and one. Yeah. And the initial set is, it's again, it's four dimensional because that's the dimension of the state space. So. Initial set, well, okay. I think it may be three um, because I think we're doing constant velocity, so it doesn't matter too much. Okay. Yeah, so we have, yeah, X, Y, and orientation, yeah. Got it, thank you. Okay, so the next question that we ask is, okay, now we've verified all of this stuff, but is it actually any useful? Um, so we built them with these models and everything. So what happens if we put this neural network on the car? Um, and so this is what happens. <laughs> um, so this actually is a, a very good example. Um, so this is, this is next to Yash's former lab at Penn. Um, so it's actually able to navigate this hallway um, without crashing. All right, so this was actually the very first experiment that we ran and everything was great. It was, it, there's some wobbly behavior because of some noisy LiDAR still, but overall it's quite good. But you'll notice that we have covered a lot of these doors. They have all these, little uh, folders or whatever we use. Um, and the, the reason for this is again, that LiDAR gets reflected. And when it does get reflected, we are basically seeing adversarial examples, right? Because these are some LiDAR scans from actual data. When we uncover the doors, um, you see that here on the right-hand side, we have these uh, LiDARs that are kind of all the way uh, at the end. So basically look, it looks as if there is no door again. But to the neural network, of course, it's never seen this data. It's basically an adversary example, and then we crash. Um, and so what we did is we said, okay, let's just train a bunch of different controllers um, and see what happens. So can we find any, for example, correlation between how easy it is to verify versus uh, how well it performs in practice? It, it looks like there is some correlation. Um, so some more robust controllers, of course, are easier to verify. Well, I shouldn't say of course, but it, most of the time, they were easier to verify. Uh, but again, these are mostly just uh, empirical findings that we didn't have any uh, time to explore further. But at this point, uh, we are unable to train a robust controller. I think this is not surprising given that we're unable to train a robust classifier for anything yet. Um, so this is kind of where we are. Um, so we've released this as a benchmark for verification reinforcement learning um, with our kind of uh, findings on, on the data. Uh, artifacts and so on. So all of data is also released. So yeah, so this is all I wanted to say about uh, this uh, case study. Oh, no, before I go, uh, one last thing. So this is actually another example where we had the dynamics model actually. Done. So here what happened was we were doing an early test going very fast, oops, okay, my screen, okay. And then we started going backwards <laughs> and then we crashed. Uh, so what happened here 
the quality was a little bad. But uh, what happened was that um, we were, we didn't know that if you, once you break, so to break, you have to apply negative thrust. But once you break, if you, once you stop, if you apply negative thrust again, you start going backwards. Um, so our model was basically wrong uh, with the dynamics and we crashed. Um, so yeah, so this was actually a fun. Um, but anyway, so I'm gonna stop here uh, with this uh, part of my work. So are, are there any last questions before I move on? Okay, if not, then let me uh, finish the second part quickly and then we can come back with questions at the end. Okay, so let me very quickly, quickly talk about my work on detection because I just wanted to mention this medical worker that I like a lot. Um, so um, just a very brief 10 minute kind of pass through that. So uh, parameter invariant detection in medical CPS. Okay, so medical CPS are actually very interesting because they have a lot of different uh, challenges that we need to address though. Um, so if we look at our closed loop system now, it's very different, right? Because now the plant <laughs> is a patient, right? A plant is, is a human um, that is connected to all these different medical devices. Um, so these devices provide uh, their measurements, of course, to uh, ideally we'd like to build some sort of a decision support system that is taking in these measurements, producing some sort of estimation detection information and send it to the clinician who then, of course, close the loop. Um, so this is kind of a, our ideal, at least for now, vision of, of this loop. But there are so many challenges here. Right? So one is that, first of all, we don't have good models of physiology, right? Because first of all, people are so different. Uh, there are all these different parameters. Of course, we also don't even understand all the physiology that happens inside the body. So this is hard. Um, on top of that, we often cannot even measure what we want because we cannot just plug in everything inside the human. Um, a lot of the measurements are invasive, they're infrequent, they're inaccurate. Uh, so the measurement side is also not very good. Uh, and then the most important for me uh, part of this loop is that we'd like to be able to provide performance with guarantees, right? So I'd like to be able to, to provide some sort of safety guarantees for our decision support system so that the clinician can, can safely use um, the system. And of course, there are, and the last link of this loop, there are also challenges because now we have uh, human machine interaction challenges as well, because we need to interact with the clinician in a meaningful way um, that, that is uh, useful to everyone. Um, and so of course my focus is again on, on the safety of these systems uh, and how do we provide performance with guarantees. Um, and so let me uh, focus on a specific case study here to kind of illustrate uh, uh, the challenges that we, that we uh, encounter and also our approach. Okay, so this problem it was something that we looked at in the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, and so here, this is, uh, we'd like to be able to monitor the patient's oxygen content during surgery. Uh, and so the specific, this is a lung surgery where they basically shove the tube, the breathing tube in one of the lungs while they do surgery on the other lung. And so this causes a shunt, which is shown in this slide. So basically the, the one of the, the baby, the patient, which is a baby usually, uh, breathes with only one lung. And that can cause problems because these babies have very small lungs. Sometimes they don't provide enough oxygen. And so this is what happens. So this is the uh, SpO2, the oxygen saturation. So this is the finger thingy, if you've ever been in a hospital, uh, that measures your uh, saturation. So sometimes when, when you're breathing with only one lung, it can get dangerously low, below 90, below 80 even. Um, and so we'd like to be able to detect or predict even when that situation will occur so that we can alert clinicians and they can take proactive action. Right, and so we had a lot of cases. Uh, we had well, not that many, but okay, a good number. Uh, we had 317 cases that had no event. That was kind of our control group. And then we had 61 cases that, had a shunt that we were trying to predict. Okay, and so currently what people do in the hospital even is they basically, they just do a retroactive kind of approach. So they measure the SpO2 through the, uh, through the pulse oximeter. And then when things start going down, then they start taking action. That's of course late. And also sometimes they're not even paying attention to the monitors because, well, they're doing surgery, right? So that's kind of the, uh, the, 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 the issue with the current method. That's why the doctors came to talk to us. And so we'd like to be able to predict these drops, right? Um, and uh, to, to predict these drops, we, we decided, okay, let's develop a shunt predictor um, as a first step that then will be used to, uh, to alert clinicians. Okay, so the main issue though with detection in any 
almost in any setting, but in a medical setting specifically is the full, right? So typically when you develop a detector, this is a standard true alarm versus false alarm rate type of uh, curve where typically any good detector will be in the top left, right? You have good true alarm performance and you get a uh, very low false alarm rate. However, what will happen in medicine often is you will inevitably get some people on the 45 degree line because some people are just, they're different. You don't have a good model for them. And then you're either alarming all the time or you're never alarming, both of which are bad. Um, so what we'd like to do is we'd like to, to pick some level of false alarm and then make sure everyone gets that. Again, some people will be on the 45 degree line because we just don't have enough information to deal with them. But if we can guarantee this type of performance, then we can say, okay, at least now clinicians will have a good uh, understanding of, of what's happening. We give them these guarantees. Um, and the other issue I should mention is that typically in medical settings now, um, there is this issue of a false uh, of a alarm fatigue. So basically clinicians have so many alarms that they start turning them off because everything is beeping all the time. And that's, that's even worse because they, they miss actual events, right? And so then that's something that we were also trying to avoid with this approach is we say, okay, you get this much uh, false alarm rate. And then of course the detection rate will vary depending on, um, on that specific uh, patient's data. So this is kind of a task. Uh, and so what we do is then, okay, as a summary of any detection technique, almost is the following, right? So we're developing is a hypothesis test. So we have two hypotheses. One is that there is no shunt, and the event hypothesis is that there is a shunt. And so then what we'll do is we'll build a model under each hypothesis, um, which is based on literature, uh, physiology literature. And then of course, these models will have parameters that will vary across people. So what we do, we have, we built a parameter invariant detector. Uh, so meaning that this, this detector has a constant false alarm rate regardless of these parameter values. So this is exactly this, um, this example that I was showing you on the previous slide. Every same uh, false alarm rate. And then finally, of course, we evaluate this uh, on the real data that we have. Okay, so, um, so very quickly, we built a model. I'm not going to talk about the model. Uh, actually, it's quite involved because SpO2 is, has this nonlinear uh, combination with the rest of oxygen in the in the blood. So there's dissolved and then there's saturated oxygen. Um, it's a long story. I'm not going to uh, talk about all the models, but uh, if you're interested, you should certainly check out the papers. Um, the model is quite uh, quite uh, exhaustive. And so then, of course, the, the goals for any model in medicine are are the following: we cannot really build a very predictive model because it's medicine. <laughs> Models are hard to build and they vary a lot across people, but it could have discriminatory power. This is the, this is what our goal, right? To be able to distinguish between the two hypotheses for which I think our model uh, did a decent enough job. Um, and also, um, in fact, we actually had to monitor for changes in, in the CO2. Um, again, uh, please check out the paper if you're interested. So, okay. So at the end of the day, what we built is we built a dynamical system uh, model. So uh, we had two states for the oxygen saturation or the CO2 at this point in each of the lungs on the left and the right hand side. And finally, we converted those models, uh, or we converted all the data rather into a time series model, which is a more standard um, signal processing notation. But you'll notice here that we have these theta parameters, which are uh, some of the unknown parameters uh, uh, for each patient, such as the, let's say, the lung thickness, um, or the uh, metabolism and so on. So I think mu is metabolism. So these are these are parameters that affect how much uh, oxygen and CO2 are, are, are used in the body and produced and consumed respectively. Okay, so now that we have this model, so now we can do our hypothesis test, right? So basically we have our two hypotheses under each, um, or we have our two models under each hypothesis. Under the null, we have the uh, hypothesis that, uh, uh, well, that there is no shunt. Um, and then under the, under the event, there is a shunt. And then what we'll do, first of all, we'll do a null space projection, um, which will get rid of some of the unknown parameters. And then finally, we end up with <laughs> what I call the base form for parameter invariance, which is a standard signal processing uh, 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 hypothesis test. Right? Under the null hypothesis, we have only noise. Under the event, we have a signal uh, with some unknown parameters theta. And then now from here, we can construct the F statistic. Um, and then for that statistic bit, then again, we can pick a threshold 
such that we raise an alarm if it's above the threshold and if it's below, we do not. Um, and we actually show that this uh, statistic is maximally invariant. Um, so again, uh, this is an informal statement, but if you're interested, uh, please talk to me later, we can uh, uh, look at the paper. So this is all the theory that we built here. So we built this uh, uh, parameter invariant detector. Um, and then we use it on the data. Again, this is, uh, uh, th this is the data that we have. Um, and so uh, actually as a slide, slide plug here, we actually built the system to actually integrate all the, all the different components. So to build the, the, to integrate the data collection and also our detector in runtime. So this was an open eye slide uh, system that we built. Um, and then we implemented actually on CHOP, in CHOP, the Children's Hospital. Um, we used it on, they didn't tell us how many patients, they said at least five because we're not allowed to <laughs> look at the data anymore. Um, but they said that it worked well on those patients too. So I cannot say anything beyond that uh, on the actual live performance. But here is the retrospective evaluation. Okay, so first of all, this is the evaluation of the false alarm rates. Uh, so this is, these are the 317 patients who have no shunt. So we ran the detector. And so every alarm here is false. So what you can see, we're comparing against a standard QSUM detector. So you can see that the QSUM detector is these red circles. For some patients, it has more than 50 alarms per hour, right? It's just constantly false alarming. Whereas our pain detector, we call the parameter invariant detector, um, is very much constant false alarm rate across all patients, right? It's less than five for everyone. So it's exactly the type of performance that we want to see, this type of a uh, constant false alarm rate performance. Um, so you can see that the maximum for us is around four and the Q sum is more than 50. Um, actually, it turns out that uh, for this case, we're even better on average. So these are ROC curves. So you can see that the, um, in this case, this is a context aware where plane detector is the outward most uh, curve, uh, meaning that it achieves the highest true alarm rate um, for any given level of false alarm rate. So this is also, um, uh, we were quite happy with this result also. Um, but let me also give you another detection results. So this is, the, the, the punchline is that um, in about 87% of the cases, we provide average of 90 second um, uh, detection uh, heads up, right? So, so this graph here basically shows the, uh, the minutes before the event, right? So you can see that there is one bar for example, minus 30 minutes, we raise an alarm. So this is not a good, not a good case because it's too early, right? So this is basically a false alarm. But you can see that for 87% of the cases, we are within a minute. So from minus five to about plus one minutes from the event, meaning that we can give clinicians a heads up so that they can take action. They can say, okay, maybe it's time to crank up the oxygen on this person and so on. Um, so this was, the, uh, this was the final performance that we had. So uh, this was uh, quite an interesting uh, result, I thought. Okay, so let me, just I have a couple more slides, I can finish that and then you can uh, have questions about the end. Um, unless you actually want to ask something now, or? Um, yeah, so I guess right. you're designing for a particular false alarm rate, right? You're picking T star as you had in your previous yes, slide. Exactly. Uh, so you designed your detector for some T star. Was that also the false alarm rate you saw in practice? Like how much did they? I think, vary? no, I don't think so. So I think what happens is the, the T star that you choose will result in some level of constant false alarm rate, but you don't know ahead of time which one because I mean, okay, the models are not uh, that good. Um, so even though we sure, designed, yeah. Um, yeah, we designed it for some level, it achieved a slightly different one, but at least empirically, it still kind of achieved a constant false alarm rate. <laughs> cool. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Good question, though. Yeah. The, um, this yeah. testing, I, I might have missed it. Um, was this testing done on real patients or is this a, the, the testing set you set aside? So this is real data, but it was retroactive. So we collected the data okay. and then we did it after that, yeah. Okay, okay, understood. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me finish the last couple of slides that I have and then we can uh, take questions uh, about everything. So just to, I guess, uh, talk a little bit about future work, right? So my agenda, of course, is in this general CPS autonomy space. So some of the things I'm interested in, um, obviously one of them is verification in a medical setting, right? Because here there are so many challenges and here is where actually 
um, verification is super important because it's a very safety critical system. Um, so one thing that I mentioned that I'm interested in is that um, the, we have all these unknown parameters. Uh, so something that verification usually does well at is what if we have uh, what if we know some ranges of parameters, which we do, right? For most people, we know some standard norms. Can we perform verification over these ranges of parameters? Um, and again, can we also make yeah, neural networks and, and whatnot uh, in the loop? So this is something that I'm very interested in. Um, and again, to see whether we can also uh, bridge this symptorial gap that I also mentioned in the, uh, in the car case, which is of course much more pronounced in the medical case. Um, and then another interesting um, topic that I'm interested in is, is, is GANs. Uh, and for the following reason, right? GANs are very good at generating uh, high dimensional, high quality examples, right? In many different fields. Uh, what I'm interested in is, can we get, uh, can we use GANs to get data driven models of, let's say uh, for our car, maybe for our cameras or for LiDAR, um, can, we, uh, can we use the GAN to, to learn a model that maybe we cannot just build for, uh, by hand because it's too too difficult. And then, um, or it would be too unrealistic to do by hand. And then once we have that, now that we have this verification technique for neural networks, can we also verify that the GAN model is actually, the system with the GAN model is actually safe. So I think this would, would provide much more um, realistic, um, uh, I guess, evidence that our system is safe, right? So this is another, uh, field that I'm kind of interested in. We have done a little bit of work here in building the models. So actually there, especially in the car case that I showed you earlier, it's actually possible to train a reasonably good GAN model. Um, but of course here, it would be hard to scale to GAN sizes because GANs are much, much bigger. Um, and then the, the even harder, I think, is how do we even know if the GAN is well trained um, and what does that even mean? Um, so those are all interesting questions. Um, and then another interesting work that I'm in trial, actually, let me skip this one in the interest of time. Um, but I should also a little bit mention uh, my work on security, right? Because I, this was mostly my PhD dissertation. Um, so there are lots of interesting questions uh, that one can ask in the security space as well, right? Um, so we've done a lot of work on uh, uh, sensor fusion where, uh, where maybe some of your sensors are under attack of your system. Uh, but because you have so many sensors on modular systems, one can use different sensors, redundant in a sense, to kind of conclude, uh, to, to, to develop an attack resilient state estimator, for example, or to conclude that the system is safe or unsafe. Um, so this is, I've done a lot of work on this, uh, this side in the uh, sense of uh, sensor attack detection, especially when some sensors may also be faulty. So for example, you can see on this image, this vehicle is, is going, is driving on snow, which means that your wheels may be spinning sometimes. Um, so your encoders are gonna be wrong. And so things like that, can we, uh, uh, can we perform attack detection um, even when, when there are faults? So we don't wanna flag faults per se. Um, and so some of the interesting questions that I'm gonna ask here is, can we combine some of the uh, classical fiber security approaches um, with our more cyber physical methods where we're mostly focused on kind of physical attacks and how they interact with the cyber world. So I think there's some interesting questions to ask here. Um, and also uh, some somewhat interesting uh, uh, direction that I haven't really explored is in the CPS security world, we have developed all of these defenses against attacks, but can we also defend against neural network attacks, so not even attacks, but just uh, vulnerabilities of neural networks. So this would be something to consider. Maybe you pick your controller in a way that you drive somewhere where the neural network is more likely to perform well, or where your distribution, um, your, you hope that your new test distribution will be similar to what you train on. Um, so these are all interesting questions as well. So again, I just want to thank all of my uh, collaborators. Uh, so my PG advisors, postdoc advisors, and all the other collaborators. Um, and I'll thank you all for listening as well. So thank you. And uh, here are the links to the, to the to our tool. Thank you, Radha. That was a very interesting talk. Um, thank you. I guess we can take a couple of minutes for questions, but I'll start. Um, sure. So in the first part uh, of the talk, when you were doing verification of, uh, I guess, <clears throat> control policies, 
what if the policy is in the form of a RNN uh, instead of a feed-forward neural network? Mm -hmm. uh, does that change anything? It, it does not in theory because we can still map it to a hybrid system. It's just going to have the the states of the neural network will be additional states in the hybrid system. Um, so in theory, it won't, it won't change anything. Um, we don't have a tool for it. So uh, yeah, it will be just a matter of coding it. Uh, I guess the bigger question is whether or not the network itself is harder to analyze. That I'm not too sure about. That'll be certainly something to think about, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. And I guess one last question on that. So right now, I guess your environment is not evolving in the verification problems. Um, yes. What if it were, for example, if, if in FN10, you want to race against another car and you're trying to verify that you don't crash into them while overtaking. Yeah, um, yeah. How would you kind of extend or take those kind of things into account? Yeah, this is certainly something that we're thinking about. Um, so it depends, okay, and the easier case is when you know the controller of the other car also. So then basically you're just gonna expand the state space and you have a bigger system. Um, that is not trivial, but that sounds doable. The harder thing will be, of course, when you don't know what the other car will do, then, um, then we'll have to think about, okay, can we maybe uh, come up with some sort of a, at least for some ranges of controls, maybe we can do something for ranges of controls of the other car. Uh, but still, we don't, we need to also have ranges of, of its other states as well. So this would be quite an interesting, I think, problem to consider for a verification person. I mean, I think it would be very impressive, but uh, <laughs> sounds hard. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. So we still have some more time. So if anyone else has questions, we can take them now. Yeah, I have a question about yeah. the, um, your F1 ton, mm -hmm. F110 uh, racing simulator, uh, was, was it able to simulate the reflections or on, only uh, well-formed uh, sensor readings? So, so the reflections are actually not that hard from a, I mean, from a functional point of view because they just give you the max range of the LiDAR um, typically. So then in simulation, we can, we can certainly simulate them um, the issue is that we don't, um, well, the, one of the issues that I didn't want to train for a specific environment was that then my network would have overfit to that environment. So I wouldn't be able to move to an environment where the door is shifted somewhere else. Um, so I was trying to give it maybe random reflections or some other patterns, which were also very hard to learn actually. So, um, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, we can, we can certainly simulate the reflections. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Can we go back to the slides we were going over the yeah. the model? Uh, um, let's see. So okay, earlier. Uh, the the car model. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, which one is it? Um. Yeah. Here. Before. 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 Yeah. Okay. So you have a neural network, and you're trying to. Oh, verify that it is not going to crash into the wall. Oh, yeah, I there see. we are. There we are. Problem statement. Okay. Uh, no, no, you, you were there. I'm a picture with a neural network on it, and you were you were translating it to your. Ah, to the model okay. We're gonna Here or the next. This, yeah, this and the next one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's just I I want to want to look at it for a bit longer because I don't think I, I don't think it got through to me the first time. Okay. Um, okay. So here is the. Okay. Yeah. This one, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's your question? You have the. Um, uh, I'm not sure what to ask. I just want to look at it again. Okay. So I mean, I can I can go through it if you want. So, please, okay, please. so maybe maybe I can go back to the previous one. So first, so just to give you the equation, uh, so that you know which one. Which. Okay. So here. So. The sigmoid derivative is at the top, right? So you have sigma, d sigma of dx is equal to sigma times one minus sigma, right? Okay, makes sense. So that's the derivative. So then what we do is we just add this t variable, right? So g of t of x, and t is just multiplied by x. That makes sense. And so now the only difference is that g, we can now compute a partial derivative with respect to t, right? So we have a g dot. G dot um, is a partial derivative. Yes, so this is this is partial g partial t. Yes. 
Okay, this is understood. Yeah. Um, and so then, then I'm just using the chain rule, right? So this is this. The second part is just that whatever we had at the top for the sigma, and then chain rule is we just have the um, x left over. Um, g, g dot is with respect to t, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, yeah. got it. So we're, yeah, so that's why we have this dangling x in front because of the this little bit of here. Uh, um, right. So because also, okay, so I mean, g dot uh, or g is also, you can express it as sigma of x times t. Um, so that's why you have this, um, the chain rule gives you the x in front. Okay. And then the other last thing to note is that we have this initial condition, right? When time is zero, we are at 0.5. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can I move on to the next slide now? All right. Yes. Okay. So remember this, these, uh, this one in the middle, this is the chain rule. This is what is in that. I just removed the T and the X um, from the equation. So here now is what's happening. So here is the G. Um, so first I need two states here. That's what the, that's the main difference. So this X will store this linear sum, the weighted sum um, uh, of the inputs, right? Uh -huh. And then G will compute the sigmoid of that X. Okay. So G starts at 0.5, exactly the same as on the previous slide. And then this is that chain rule equation in the green. Mm -hmm. So now G, when it starts from 0.5, as time evolves until time one, G will be tracking that sigmoid curve. And at time one exactly, when we have this transition to the next mode, G will be already exactly the, the value of the sigmoid. Mm -hmm. And then effectively we have computed after one layer, we have computed the values of all those sigmoids. Um, after the first mode, we have computed exactly the values of all the neurons after the first layer. So those that there's a one-to-one -one map in that sense. Understood. I'm sorry. Understood. Okay. So that's mostly then it's the same game after that. So now the X is the weighted sum. And then the G again goes back to half. So now the X is the weighted sum of all the previous sigmoids. The G goes back to half, and then the G computes the sigmoid of the X again in the next layer. Okay. So that's yeah, that's pretty much all there is to it because now we have the entire um, hybrid system. Of course, I'm okay. I need one more mode for the last layer, which I didn't have space for. Um, and then that last mode will give me these values for the U1 and U2, which are then fed back into the plant as the controls. Okay, and now that we have this hybrid system, mm -hmm. how do we use it to verify that the original system is safe? Oh, well, now we have a one-to-one -one map between this hybrid system and the original system, which had the neural network as a controller, because the hybrid system is functionally the same as the neural network. So now we just have a hybrid system instead of a neural network. So then we can use the techniques from before that I showed you earlier with all those other tools with the flow pipes and so on. Okay, let's have a look at the flow pipes again. Okay. The flow pipes, uh, which slide would that be the same? I guess. Ah, exactly, okay. So this is, I mean, okay, this is more pictorial than, than uh, anything else, but uh, what happens is we have our initial set of states and then we have this reachable set. Um, and so what happens here, I mean, technically speaking, there is a, in most of these tools, use some sort of a Picard iteration where they take the ODE, they compute uh, a small um, solution of over a small period of time, they compute a solution with some error bounds. And then that's one flow pipe. And then the, that flow pipe is used as initial conditions for the next one and so on and so forth. So if you, if you have a very small time between the flow pipes, you can be very precise in your calculation of a stretchable set. But of course, it's computationally more expensive. Okay, and it feels like the um, reachable set should grow very fast. It can, in some cases, yes. If you have a very large network or if you have very complex uh, plan dynamics, it can grow very fast, yes. But the reason it, it doesn't grow very fast here is because you actually have the network 
trying not to crash into the wall. Yes, exactly. So yeah, actually this is, I didn't talk about this, but we also had to train the network a bit more carefully so that basically it has contracted, it basically it's a contracted map of sorts so that all the trajectories kind of converge to, to one trajectory, if you will. So that's kind of important in general. For reachability, if your true reachable set is expanding, then you, you'll have a very hard time verifying. Okay. Because the first thing I, I thought of when I saw this was, okay, well, I can go forwards, I can go backwards, I can go to the side. And then from each of mm -hmm. those points, I can go forwards, backwards to the side, and then yes. I can go into the wall. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Exactly, yeah. So if you're not crashing, I mean, if, if you are crashing, then you should just simulate it first, right? Because this is only, this is, it, it makes sense to, to first do a bit of simulation so that you can quickly find if there is a counter example, then you just don't bother with this because this is going to take you hours of computation time. Right. So th this is this is you've done your normal tests. It seems to be working pretty well. Now you're triple checking. Exactly. Yes. 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 Okay. Thanks. That makes things clearer. Yeah. I'm glad. Very good. Any other? Uh, yeah, so I just had a question with regards to uh, the number of nodes that you have in this actual controller, because I'm assuming if you increase the number of nodes, it, increase, uh, it increases like the degree to which your system is actually hybrid. And I'm assuming that sort of also affects the computation time that it takes for like those reachability tools that you're talking about to actually get to like compute those sets. And I'm assuming it's going to be especially a problem in practice if you're like trying to generalize to uh, a different environment and then you're sort of slightly tweaking your neural network every time and then you have to rerun these tools with every sort of slight modification that you make. Yes, so okay, I mean, you, you made a few points there, so let me kind of disentangle them. So one is, yeah, generalization is is a completely different ball game, right? That's, that's I mean, it's hard in different ways because that's more have to more has to do with the simple-real gap, right? So you train in simulation. Now, does it generalize to the real world? Who knows, right? That's a different. Um, I mean, I'm also interested in that, but uh, that is kind of orthogonal to verification because in verification we only verify the model that we built. Um, so, but your other point is also valid that um, if you have a bigger network, you have a bigger controller, it will be harder to verify. In, in fact, it might also be a more complex controller because it's a more complex network. So those are true. Um, we have been able to verify bigger networks. I forget what was the biggest one on this case study. Uh, we, um, we had a separate paper where I think we did one with uh, 200 something neurons per layer, uh, but it certainly gets harder and harder, especially because when you have these giant, if you have a fully connected layer, 200 doesn't sound like a lot, but when you have 200, that means you have 200 squared weights in that layer. Um, so that's quite a lot for, uh, for these uh, tools. Um, so it, it is true that they get, it gets harder, but overall the hardest thing is not just the size, but also just the actual complexity of the function that it implements. Let's thank Rado again for the very interesting talk. Uh, thank you, Rado. Thank you for Thank time. you very much. Thank you for inviting me also. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you everyone for attending and for the questions. And uh, yeah, see you all around. Thank you, Bye. Thank you very Have much. Have a good one. See you.